Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone this morning to this minister's conference. And I pray that the Lord will impact your life in a very definite way in Jesus' name. Now, when we say minister's conference, there are many people that limit the word minister. I'll show you from the word of God how extensive, expansive is that word minister. Meanwhile, let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time. We bless your name because you are God, creator, Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords, Lord Jesus, we thank you because you are Savior, our Redeemer, and we know that you have placed us on earth to do something specific and something definite for the glory of your name. We pray, Lord, your appointment in our lives will not be in vain. As you have chosen us, as you are sending us forth, we pray by your grace, in the strength of the Lord, and in the power of the Holy Ghost within us, we will do what you expect us to do on earth, and there will be great reward on the final day in Jesus' name. Amen. Be glorified in every life, magnified through every life, that your work in our hands will prosper now and until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Today, as we come to the beginning of the minister's uh, conference, I'm going to look at 2 Timothy. And as we look at 2 Timothy, we're dealing with the subject, an appointed minister for an assigned ministry. An appointed minister for an assigned ministry. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle means a man that is sent, sent forth with a message. And when God called Paul the apostle, he appointed him, he assigned him as to what he was to do. And then he said, it's by the will of God. There's a lot there. According to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, whereunto I am appointed. He knew there was an appointment. And he knew that that appointment was by the will of God, for the work of God, and to preach the word of God. It was by the will of God. And it was to be the presentation of the word of God in the fulfillment of the work of God. He said, I am appointed a preacher. So, if he didn't preach, he will know he was not in the will of God. Then he said, and an apostle, if he didn't go forth in the power, and in the mood, and in the pursuit of the apostolic ministry, he would know he wasn't fulfilling what he was assigned to. And then he said, a teacher of the Gentiles. If you only taught the Jews who were people like him, if you only taught the Jews who had believed in the law of Moses, if he felt that's where I'm comfortable and that's what I'm going to do, it would not have fulfilled the will of God or the calling of God, a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, I want to pick three words there in that verse. I am appointed and i want you to write that down on your notebook there i am appointed 
Anybody that is appointed by God is appointed to do something. We don't have the time to check up all the references. Moses was appointed. Aaron was appointed. The Levites were appointed. You might call them Christian workers. They were appointed. You might call them deacons. They were appointed. You might give them any role. They were appointed. Samuel, as a little boy, as a little child, with Eli in the temple, he was appointed. Any of them could have said, I am appointed now. As we look at Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 1, there's another man there. The man is Cyrus, and that Cyrus could have said, I am appointed. In fact, God called him mine anointed. Come on to the New Testament. As we look at the New Testament, we know that Jesus Christ said, I have come not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And then he said, I am among you as he that serveth. He could have said, I am appointed. And then he called the twelve. And all the twelve that they will be with him. And that they will learn from him. And then he will send them forth to preach. They were appointed. And now Paul the apostle said, I am appointed. Now, as you look at Romans chapter 13, Verse 4, you'll see the use of the word ministered there. Look at your Bible. Romans chapter 13, verse 4, and it refers to the kings. It refers to the people in government. It refers to the people that God had appointed to oversee the affairs of the nation. And what did he call them? For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is, look at that, the minister of God, an avenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So you know that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they do not limit the word minister to just the pastors of the churches or the founders of denominations, but they extend the use of that word minister to who we will call the professionals, a doctor, as a minister appointed, assigned to do something. An engineer is a minister assigned to do a particular work for the good of the nation. And of course, those who are political leaders, they are also appointed to do something for the nation. And so, as you come back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, you want to pick up those words and you want to apply them to yourself. I am appointed. Maybe a preacher, maybe an engineer, maybe a doctor, maybe a mother, and maybe a father, maybe a pastor, maybe whoever. You are appointed and assigned to do something. Say, I am appointed. I pray that your appointment will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Now, an appointed minister. <clears throat> an appointed minister. And then an assigned ministry. You must understand the perimeter. You must understand the definition, the description of what you are assigned to do. Can you just take a moment and think, okay, I'm appointed. What am I appointed by God to do? Why am I here on earth? What will I refer to that I've done? When I get back to the Lord, he sent me here. 
He appointed me here. He gave me an assigned ministry. And now, when I go back to him, eventually, on the reckoning day, I will have to answer to the assignment he gave me to do so that I will know I have fulfilled the work he gave me to do. That's what we're looking at today. We're looking at an appointed minister for an assigned ministry. There are three points I'm going to look at as I look at the chapter, chapter one. And there are three words I bring to you. Number one is the word grace. Grace. Number two is the word gift. And number three is the word greet. That means you have tenacity. That means you're able to hold on. That means whatever the wind, that means however rough the way it might be. That means whatever challenge you might have. That means no matter the demand of the assigned ministry, you have the greet. You have the courage, you have the stamina, and you have the power and the strength to hold on. The power to hold on and keep on standing and keep on in the assigned ministry. Whatever the challenge might come your way. Grace, gift, greed. Number one, it's appointment into the ministry by God's grace. Not because A is better than B. Not because our sister is higher than our brother. Everyone has the appointed ministry. Appointment into the ministry by God's grace. Number two, assistance for the minister with God's gift. When God appoints anyone and he sends forth anyone, he gives him support. He gives him succor. He builds something underneath him that is able to withstand and able to take the heat of the day, the heat of each day. He gives him assistance. The assistance is varied. It tells us angels are medicine spirits. They give assistance. It tells us Christ says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He gives us assistance. It says, I'm with you. Even to the end of the world, he gives us assistance. And then the gift he brings into our lives. Assistance to the, uh, to, for the minister with God's gift. Number three is the affirmation of the mandate. The mandate is the commission. The mandate is what God has given you to uh, excel in, and it is affirmation of his mandate through the God-given greed. The God-given greed. Let's look at them one by one. Number one is appointment into the ministry by God's grace. Oh, we need to be grateful and thankful to the Lord that the Lord knew about us before we were born. He knew us like he knew Paul when he was born because he said, it's the God, the God of heaven that brought me out of my mother's womb. And then he said, when it became time, to make me preach the revelation of Christ. He called me by his grace. And he said, immediately I comfort not with flesh and blood. When he calls, there are people that will say like Moses, Lord, you know I can't. You know I'm a stammerer. You know I don't have what it takes. He knew you beyond your knowing yourself. And if he called you by his grace, he knew that his grace is sufficient for you. I want to tell you today that God's grace is sufficient for you. Amen. To fulfill your calling, God's grace is sufficient for you. 
to lead and to live the way he wants you to live. Whatever the challenge and whatever the difficulty, God's grace is sufficient for you. Don't quit. Don't run away. Don't sneak out. Don't say, I don't think I can bear the fire, the fury of the situation. You will. You'll stand. You will stay. And the Lord will prove to you that whatever assignment he has given to you, you have the grace to go through your will in Jesus' name. As I talk about the grace of God, why don't we look at three things. Number one, assured of salvation by grace. Assured of salvation by grace. Number two, appointed to service through grace. It's the same grace, the grace that called you into the kingdom, also appointed you into the service. And then number three, assisted and sustained with grace. It's all of grace from the beginning, salvation, to the service, the appointment, and then to the climax, the consummation of what God has called you to do. It's all by grace. Today, the grace of God will be in your life. Look at those three things. Number one, assured of salvation by grace. I'm sure you know this, but I'm going to tell you again. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And we need to remember every time that by grace, God's grace, supernatural grace, the grace of Christ coming from Calvary, by grace am I saved. By grace are you saved. And if there is any time you doubt your salvation, go back to the grace of God. What's grace? It is God's riches at Christ's expense. The songwriter said, Jesus Christ paid it all. He paid it all, all for your salvation, all for your redemption, all for you coming out of darkness into the light. He paid it all, for by grace are ye saved through faith. I like to make it personal so that I know it's not just reaching for humanity, it is reaching for me, it's reaching for you. By grace am I saved. By grace I am I saved. Say it like you believe it. Through faith, and that not of myself, it is the gift of God. Now, a gift is not something you merit. Salvation is not something you merit. Coming into the kingdom is not something you merit. By grace, are you saved through faith? I want you to look at Titus chapter 2 and in verse 11. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It says over there, it says, The grace... For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. When the grace of God came to you, came to me, that grace of God did not come empty-handed. It brought something. Brought a gift from heaven. Brought salvation. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. All kinds of men. Lo. High, far, near, tribal, traditional, everyone. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Any tribe, every tribe, every community has access to the grace of God. You, 
your family and the extended family and the ones that were think are very bad, as bad as Saul of Tarsus. The grace of God comes and comes to everyone and thank God it has reached you. And it has come to you. And by the grace of God, you have been brought in. Always remember that. I was outside. Now I am in. By the grace of God, it has appeared unto all men. Then in verse 12, then the grace of God begins to work. Heaven has said that grace. Now, look at that grace now as a person. Saint from God has appeared unto you. You welcomed him. Personalize that. Make it like a person. You welcomed him and he came to stay with you. And you were somebody that didn't even know left from right. And what has the grace of God come to do? It says, teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly laws, what that means is, before grace came, we reveled in ungodliness. We were swimming in worldly laws. We ate, we took in, we lived our lives in ungodliness and worldly laws. And God knew that. And all the same, even though he knew we were kind of drowning in worldly laws and ungodliness, he still brought grace. Why? Because grace is not what you merit. And the grace still came. As the grace came now, that grace now will begin to teach us we begin to transform us. we begin to turn our lives around that we should live now different from how we were living before. Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And the grace of God that makes other people to live godly, righteous in this present world, that grace of God will work in your life. You've heard about many people, those people, their lives were transformed. They became very different and distinguished. And their lives, it was like they're now on the ivory tower in Christian behavior. Remember, it's all of grace. And that same grace will work that out in your life. In my life. In my life. The grace of God will help you, will help every one of us to live soberly, righteously, and godly when in this present world. I said when in this present world. That's the assurance we have of salvation by grace. Let's come to number two there. Number two is appointed to service through God's grace. There are people that are always looking back. I am appointed to do this, but they are always saying, do I think I can make anything good out of this? Do I think I can excel out of this? And then they begin to remind themselves as they are reminding God, God, you know me. I am not a very strong person. God, you know me. I am not like uh, pastor so and so. I am not like mommy so and so. I am not like evangelist so and so. Are you giving God information? You are, you are telling God what he didn't know. Good luck to you. There is nothing you are telling God about yourself. I am not. I cannot. I don't think I'm able. There's nothing you are telling God that he didn't know. But all the same, even though he knew all that you are telling him about your weakness, about your inability, about the fact that you don't have the skill, you don't have what it takes to do this, he said, thank you for the information. But all the same, I have appointed you for service. 
I have appointed you for service. I am appointed. Somebody there, I am appointed. Look at this now. Appointed to service through God's grace. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 15. It says, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace. Now, if God were to set up a committee, and that committee saddled with the responsibility of choosing another apostle, We've got apostle for the Jews. Now we're looking for the, an apostle for the Gentiles. And God says, the committee, and he chooses Peter, and he chooses James, and he chooses another one there. And then maybe there's a supervising angel and said, give me a suggestion and choose somebody to be an apostle to the Gentiles. They look at all the people available. There's one name that will never come to their mind. Whose name is that? Paul. Will never come to their mind. If you were chosen by committee, or if you were to be chosen by committee, you will not be where you are. This is not the committee's choice. You are God's choice. I am God's choice. You're chosen by God. Nobody would have recommended you, but the Almighty God, who knew what he created you for, he has appointed you. I am appointed for service. Somebody there, I'm appointed for service. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, to reveal a son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen immediately. Immediately, I comfort not with flesh and blood. You know, there are people that take pride in delay. They say, you know what? God called me. And he called me about 10 years ago. And I'm still considering it. I'm weighing the options. Should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? Should I say yes? Should I say no? Should I say, here am I, God, or God, hold on for me? I'm still thinking of this. I'm still thinking of that. But in the case of Paul the Apostle, he said that God could even think of me. I should have been in hell even now. But that God could think of me to reveal a son our Savior, our Lord, to reveal that son through me, I just grabbed it immediately. If you have been delayed today, you'll say yes to God. Yes to God. Let somebody say yes to God. The Lord has called you. You will not delay any longer in Jesus' name. Now, Paul... How are you going to do this? You are appointed for service. And it is all by grace. How will you fulfill it? It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am what I am. If you saw somebody very strong, very active, very healthy, and it's all the time on top of every situation, and you say, I'm not as strong as that, and I'm not like this, I want to go and ask this person, how is it you are this strong? How is this? You are this healthy? And he said, well, number one, diet. Number two, the regulation of his life and everything. And you want to, and he says, that can happen to anybody. And then you copy that down, diet, 
and then the regulation of life and everything and if you practice the same thing it's just a matter of time you'll be strong i will be strong now the man that will see the champion of the apostles the man that will see here and there and here the man that will see ministering with all the gifts of god the man that will see in power in strength anywhere he went he said it's not of me it's not my background it's not my constitution it says by the grace of god I am what I am. Finish. That means I can ask him, how is it that grace of God? How did it work in your life? And then if I submit to that grace of God, that grace of God will work in my life. I see everyone climbing. And I see you on the ladder. And I see you. You are climbing one step by grace, the next step by grace, the next step by grace, the next step by grace. And whatever height other people have reached, by grace. Somebody shout, by grace. By grace. You will be there. By, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it's grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain the grace of god in your life will not be in vain it will work in your personal life it will work in your professional life it will work in your pastoral life it will work everywhere all through your life in jesus name it was not in vain but i labored grace makes us labor paul why are you there at Corinth? Why are you there at Ephesus? Why are you there in the province of Galicia? Why are you there in Philippi? How are you able to do that? What's the strength? What's the secret of your ability? It says, by grace I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I. Yet not I. This grace from today will become more visible in your life. More visible in your labor. It says, but the grace of God which was with me. With me. With me. That grace will never leave your life. Let's come to number three here. Number three here. Assisted and sustained with grace. Assisted and sustained with grace. Now, we must understand, grace is never tired. So, if God has sent grace to assist me, my body may be tired, but the grace assisting me will never be tired. You might become weary, but the grace that the Heavenly Father has sent into your life will never be weary. There might be storm, there might be stories, there might be things you will hear, and that information will deflate your balloon. Now, that information never deflates the balloon of the grace that has given you. The grace is always there, and therefore, he assists you, and he sustains you with grace. I pray the grace of God will not be invaded in your life. And whenever you are tired, lean on the grace of God. Whenever you are discouraged, lean on the grace of God. <coughs> when it appears the wind is getting out of your balloon and you are going to be deflated, and flat, flattened, lean on the grace of God. And that grace will be sustained in your life. Acts chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 33. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace. And great grace, and great grace was upon them all. 
I want you to understand. Notice that word all. Great grace was upon them all. Normally, naturally, Peter was of a different constitution than John. Naturally. Matthew was like of a different constitution, composition from Philip. But whatever their stature, whatever their background, whatever their constitution, whatever their disposition, great grace was upon them all. Can I tell you that great grace is available for you? Yeah. In the assignment he has given us, in the work he has given us, when it appears, can I, will I be able to jump that hurdle? Will I be able to climb that steep mountain? I had so and so did it. And I'm wondering, how did they do that? Great grace upon me, upon you, upon us all. I see what that great grace, you cannot fail. You might have failed, that's past tense. But now, today, you rise up. Power, authority, anointing. Help from above. Come upon you today in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two here now. Number two is the assistance for the minister with God's gift. Assistance for the minister with God's gift. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Wherefore, I put you in remembrance that thus stir up the gift of God. Now Paul was reminding Timothy, you have, number one, the grace of God for salvation, for service. For sustainers. And then, number two, you have the gift of God. Stir it up. Which is in thee. In thee. In thee. It says, by the putting on of my hands. Now, if something is in you, in proximity, you can easily touch it. And you recognize it. You feel the presence there. But if you hang up your hand for a long time, what you don't use, you will lose. It will atrophy. That means it will get out of use. And the gift that is there will be dormant when you don't use that gift. You remember? All those good subjects were studied at, in school. Maybe you went to secondary school and this subject distinction, that subject distinction, that subject credit, and on and on. And you got a certificate. And since that certificate came, you didn't read anything about those subjects where you had distinction. And you didn't continue to study that subject where you had distinction. Now, Everything is like forgotten. And if, um, you know, SS1 student will say, help me with this assignment, you cannot. Why? Because that thing has become dormant. It's now dead. The same thing with the gift of God. The gift of God is your life. And Paul told Timothy, Timothy, you know, you have all it takes. You have the grace, all it takes. You have the gift, all it takes. But because that thing has become dormant, that's why it appears it's not working. Stir it up. 
Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in you. It's still there. It's still there. It's still there. Stir it up by the putting on of my hands. I'm looking at three things here. Number one, the source of his unspeakable gift. The source of his unspeakable gift. Number two, the stirring up of our unused gifts unused gifts that has become dormant stir it up number three our service with the unsurpassable gift our service with the unsurpassable gift that means if somebody gave me the gift of a car and i want to serve I want to travel to a place, I'll not leave the car behind and then go on foot in my human strength and go to the place. What did I have? The gift. If somebody bought a ticket for me to travel from here to that other destination, then I get out of my house. I'm not going to leave the gift of that ticket behind and then I say I'm traveling. The same thing. God has given me the gift. God has given you the gift. And when you come to service and when you go in service, you are conscious that the gift the Lord has given you, you are taking that gift along. And it is through that gift, not by yourself, not with the empty hand, not with the empty human ability. That's not how you are going to succeed. By the gift he has given you, I know you will succeed. I see success reaching on your ministry. Success on your appointment and success on everything you do with the gifts in Jesus' name. Number one, the source of his unspeakable gift. Look at John chapter 4 verse 10. It says, John answered and Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God. If he had only known the gift of God. Now, Jesus was standing before that woman. And the woman did not recognize the gift of God. She was still arguing on her tribe. We are Samaritans, and you are a Jew. How sayest thou to me, give me to drink? And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, you will not bring nationalism into a discussion. If you knew the gift of God, you will not bring denominationalism into the, into the discussion. If you knew the gift of God, you will not bring religion into our discussion. If you knew the gift of God, you will not bring tribalism into our discussion. Forget about that Samaritans and Jews. She was a Samaritan. But the gift of God was available for her. And wherever you are, wherever you are coming from, forget about your tribe. Forget about the name of your church. Forget about what you are, what you are not, where you are being. Forget your history. The gift of God is right here before you. And it is yours. I said it is yours. If thou only knew the gift of God and who it is that says unto thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him and he would have given you the living water. You just ask and it will be given unto you. It will be given unto me. I can't hear you now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, it says, Thanks be unto God. 
I look at my life. What could I do without that gift? Thanks be unto my God. I look at where I'm going, and then the distance I've covered, and I say, thanks be unto God. I look at the challenges, and I look at the power to sustain, to sustain you in, in that ministry, and in those challenges. And all we can say is, thanks be unto God. And I know the assignment today, and I know what you are still to accomplish today. All I can say concerning you is, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Unspeakable, unstoppable, unimaginable, immeasurable gift of God. And whatever you need of that gift of God is available for you today. Look at number two here. Number two is the stirring up, stirring up of our unused gifts. Let me ask you, can you think of your life and think of gifts you have not used for some time? Ten years ago, you used to manifest this kind of gift, but no more. And then maybe for five years ago, you used to have this kind of gift and that kind of gift. And if you had continued a step at a time, a day at a time, a challenge at a time, a ministration at a time, an act at a time, and work at a time, that gift would have matured. But then everything has been dormant because the gift was not used. Now, Paul the Apostle is saying, Timothy, you know what? There is nothing you need that is far away. Do I go to Jerusalem? You don't need to. Do I go to Canada? You don't need to. Do I go to such and such a place? You don't need to. That gift is inside you. All you need to do, stir it up. Stir it up. I remember something. Yeah, the power of the Spirit of God to move and to shake anything shakeable in the territory of the enemy. And then we are told he began to stir up the gift of God in him. I remember Joseph. Joseph was the dreamer and the interpreter of dreams. But now for a long time after I was sold into Egypt, that gift of the dream interpretation had not come into use. But then Pharaoh had a dream. And all of a sudden, after interpreting the dream of those two servants, that thing was stirred up. He was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. And that's how the gift of God is uh, stirred up in our lives. What you were before, go back memory lane and say, I used to be like this, I used to be like that, when that grace of God, when that power of God first came on me, and now stir up the gift of God in you. It will work again. I said it will work again. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're looking at verse 6. It says, Wherefore I put you in remembrance. That's the first thing to do. That's the first thing to do. Remember. Remember. What have I got? I'm praying for more and more of this, more and more of this. Hold on. Before you pray for more, remember. What have you got already? What had been active and operative in your life from the past? Remember, then repent. If there's anything you've done to make the gift not working, not active, and not achieving, you repent. Lord, I remember the way you used to deal with me. And the way you used to relate with me. And the things I used to do in accomplishing the calling you have given me. I remember 
I know this, this, this. My bureau you see why the gift is dormant. Now I repent. Then renew. Renew your commitment. Renew your consecration. And renew your devotion to the service of the Lord. I know I know that when I became slower and sluggish and then I gave up part of what the Lord wanted me to do, I acted like this, I acted like that. That's why the gift became dormant. I remember, I repent, I renew, and then I refocus. I refocus on what? I'm called to do. I know this is my calling. I'm going to give a hundred percent of my life, of my time, of my devotion, of my dedication into what the Lord had called me to do. You stir up the gift of God in you. That fire will burn again. That flame will come up again in Jesus' name. I'm looking at number three here now. Number three is our service with the unsurpassable gift. Our service with the unsurpassable gift. Somebody saw you. You are cultivating a farm. And you add your cutlass and you add your hoe. And the fellow saw that if you could have some machinery, that you will go very far. And so he comes to you and he says, Do you know there is something called, then you call the name of that machinery, you can, you know, cultivate the land, you can plant, you can do everything, and you can lay the cutlass and the hoe aside, and this, uh, this is what we call mechanized farming, it will get you faster to the place you ought to get to. And then you say, thank you very much for telling me that, and he bought that thing for you. With that, you can cultivate, you can weed, you can, you know, turn the uh, soil, you can do the planting, you can do everything. But then uh, you pack that thing there and you see great gift donated by Mr. So-and-so, donated by Mrs. So-and-so. I appreciate them. Uh, what a great gift. But then... Uh, you're not used to that machinery. You keep on using your cutlass and using your hoe. How about that gift? That gift is unsurpassable. That gift will do what your cutlass and hoe, what they will do in six months. That thing will do it in one day. Why don't you switch over? The gift of God is like that. You know, the human nature, the human skill, the human ability, there is only limit to where you can get you but then uh, when God favors you and God has favored you today and he gives you the unsurpassable gift and with that gift you are able to do what the Lord has called you to do you will work like any other person who is successful in ministry and in the work in Jesus name and look at this and look at what Paul the apostle said now concerning Timothy we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we're looking at verse 17 here it says in 1st Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 for this cause have I sent unto you Timothy who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ as I teach in, uh, as I teach everywhere in every city. Look at the recommendation now. He had told him, stir up that guild. And he stirred up the guild. And Paul the apostle said confidently now, 
I can send Timothy unto you. You will go everywhere the Lord has appointed for you in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 16, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10, is talking about Timothy again, and he's talking about this man who has touched up the gift of God in him. And because of that now, he's able to labor at the same level. He's able to labor with the same strength. He's able to labor with the same vision as Paul the Apostle. Look at it. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10. Now, if Timothy come, see that he may be with you without fear. For Look at this. Look at this. He walketh the work of the Lord as I also do. If he didn't start up the work, the, uh, the gift of God in him, Paul would not have been able to say, look at me, look at him, look at him, look at me. We walk the work of God in the same way, with the same fervency, with the same zeal, with the same power, with the same effectiveness, for he walketh the work of the Lord as I also do. I pray that will be a testimony concerning you. I said concerning you. The gift of God stirred up in you. And if you're going to stop that gift of God, you'll not allow laziness, you'll not be laid back, you'll not continue saying the same old, old things you have been saying, I cannot, I don't have this, I don't have that. You have everything it takes to succeed, and you are going to succeed. We come to point number three. Point number three is the affirmation of his mandate through the God-giving greed. The God-giving greed. Now, if we're going to succeed at anything, we must keep on doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. We must do it in the day. In the day of strength, the day of sunshine, keep on doing it. We must do it in the night. In the night of discouragement, in the night of impossibilities and challenges in our community, we keep on doing it. If we're going to succeed at anything, it is not an occasional involvement. It's spasmodic involvement. It is not, uh, we do it today and then uh, the next seven, eight months, we don't know where we are again. Uh, we walk for one hour and then we rest for 28 days. We cannot do it like that. If we go in uh, to fulfill the mandate, the Lord has given us affirmation of his mandate through God giving greed. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Hold fast that the greed, the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice those words, hold fast. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Let me point out three things again. Number one, fear not, hold fast. Fear not, hold fast. Number two, Faint not, hold forth. Number three, forget not, hold firm. Look at number one. Fear not, hold fast. Hold fast. You have faith in God, hold that fast. You have the gospel, hold that fast. You have the assurance. God is with me. I am with God. Hold it fast. I am appointed. 
appointed not to be a failure, appointed to be a success. Hold fast. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading from verse 23. Something to hold fast. Something to hold unto. Something to understand. The Lord has given it to you. And you are holding fast. It says, let us hold fast. Paul says, I'm holding fast. You hold fast. Tell my brother there, hold fast. Tell my sister there, hold fast. Tell everyone appointed, appointed to a calling, appointed to a service, hold fast. Let us, that's how we succeed together. Let us, that's how we climb the mountain together. Let us, that's how we're able to do the unthinkable and the incredible together. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You don't give any chance and you don't give any space to any doubt in your heart, any fear in your heart, any timidity anywhere in your constitution because you know I am appointed to an assigned ministry and as the affirmation of that assigned ministry let us then hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised when the lion of the tribe of judah is always by your side defending you how can you fear when the one that has never lost any battle, when he's abiding with you and he's staying with you, how can you ever fear? When you know that this that you are doing was appointed by God and you are the appointed one to accomplish it and God is not going to quickly replace you if you are there and you say, I'm committed, I'm consecrated, I'm going to do it. How can you fear? Let us hold fast. There is no job that the Lord has given you that you will not accomplish. You're an achiever. You are an, an achiever. You're a conqueror. You've been more than a conqueror. Number two is faint not, hold forth. Faint not. Hold forth. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 14 there. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Why? Here's what you're appointed for. Do it. You, don't, you shouldn't murmur. And why do they put all the, all the assignment on me? It's not they, it's God. He knows the grace he has given you. He knows the strength he has given you. He knows the chance and the opportunity he has given you. And he says, I'm by your side. I'm doing it with you. Why would you murmur when you know the Almighty himself is there with you? And he will carry you through. He will carry you through. Do all things, all things, without murmurings and disputings. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation. Crooked and perverse nation. There are some people that say the nation is crooked, the nation is corrupt, the nation is perverse, and the, you know the community is dangerous, and now they cannot do anything. Daniel tells us, the streets shall be built in troublous times. Even in this time, you will still accomplish. Even in this time, you will still achieve in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then in verse 16, it says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, 
that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You will not run in vain. I said you will not run in vain. Sometimes, sometimes when you plant, you don't see it coming up at the same time that you have planted. Have I labored in vain? Have I planted in vain? You will not labor in vain. Somebody plants maize, corn, and within a few days it's coming up. Another one, another plant, uh, one plants cocoa, and after the maize has, uh, you know, got up, and already they are even harvesting uh, that one that planted cocoa, it's almost just uh, coming up, and it says, why is my own so slow like this? Well, cocoa, and all that other things that take long time to germinate, they are more uh, they are more uh, costly than the maize. Maybe what you are planting is for the next generation. And because of that, you are not seeing the excitement and the you know, rushing and everything. Keep on planting. You will not labor in vain. Yeah. You are building anything that the Lord has called upon you to build and to labor on, it will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Faith not, hold forth, it will come through. And then it tells us, number three now, it says, forget not, hold firm. Forget not, hold firm. Do not forget that Christ has chosen you. Do not forget that the grace of God is sufficient for you. Do not forget that everything you need is in Christ. He is the unspeakable gift. He is the unsurpassable gift. He is the unbreakable, unconquerable gift. And through that gift in you, don't forget, when you are tired, lean on him. When you are weary, lean on him. When it appears, can I take another step forward? In the strength of the Lord, you'll take the next step forward in Jesus' name. Faint not Hold firm. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse 6. It tells us there in Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse 6, it says, But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast, hold firm, the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope firm unto the end. You will hold fast. I will hold fast. You will hold a fourth. I didn't hear you now. I will hold fall. And you will hold firm. 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 Your calling, you'll not let it go. Your service, you'll not let it go. Your faith, you'll not let it go. The grace of God, you'll not let it go. And Christ, Christ, who will make you everything you will be, you will not let him go. Don't forget, hold firm. Success is before you. Where are you? Rise up and tell the Lord, I'm going to hold fast. I'm going to hold forth. I'm going to hold firm. Tell the Lord, I remember your grace. Your grace has called me to salvation. Your grace has called me to service. And your grace has called me to sustenance. And I know you are going to be with me until then. And there is no, there, there is no impartiality with God. It's the same for everyone. That grace of God has appeared unto all men. And it will make you righteous. It'll make you as firm as you ought to be. It'll keep you standing and nothing will blow you down. The wind of circumstance will not blow you down, will not destroy you. As long, as long, as long you are alive, you'll remain in the ministry God 
has called you to. And then the gift of God. The gift of God. That gift is unspeakable. That gift is beyond even the assignment the Lord has given you. And whatever you need of the part of that gift, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Remember, remember that gift that you have. And if you have been misusing that gift or you have not used that gift properly, repent. And then come to the Lord. Let there be a renewal, a renewal, and a total restoration of the gift of God in your life. And then, uh, you know, there is nothing to fear under the sun. There is nothing to fear in the path of ministry. Fear not, hold fast. And you understand, there's nothing that you cause fainting. Don't faint, faint not, hold forth the word of life. And then, uh, don't forget, the promise is unto you and to your children and to as many as the Lord has called. Don't forget that the grace of God is sufficient for you. Sufficient. 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 Everything you need is available. Faint not. Forget not. Hold firm. Always remember. You are appointed by God. I am appointed. I am appointed. I am appointed. And the Lord was appointed you. Will never leave you. Will never forsake you. Succeeding, you will succeed. In what he has appointed for you to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Now you know you are appointed. Are you appointed? Yeah. I am appointed. I am appointed. God who appointed me, say that, has not made a mistake. I may think, say that, I am not worthy. I may think, say that, I am not able. I may think, say that, I am weak. But God has provided everything that will make me succeed. I am an achiever. I am more than a conqueror. My ministry will bear fruit. My work will bear fruit. My profession will bear fruit. Everything I do, by the calling of the Lord, everything I do, by the appointment of the Lord, will have the stamp of success. The stamp of approval. I will not look back. I keep on looking forward. Raise up your hands, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for reminding us that you have appointed us. And in what you have appointed us to, every one of us, without exception, will succeed in Jesus' name. More grace for everyone. More gift, appropriate gift for everyone. And the power to hold on tenaciously, without looking back, without fearing, without fainting, without forgetting, grant everyone in Jesus' name. Success all the way through. Accomplishment all the way through. And the new strength, the new knowledge you have given us, Lord, we will not forget again in Jesus' name. The gift of God that is stirred up in us will work without failing. Amen. Confirm it, O Lord. 
And Lord, if there's any weakness in the body, any sickness in the body, they're not supposed to be there. And therefore we command, come out in Jesus' name. Strengthen everyone. Heal everyone. Lift up everyone. And make everyone succeed in the mandate you have given us. It is done. It is confirmed. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You are lifted up. You are lifted.